Good afternoon everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Alex McCutcheon. I'm the director of Unicom Seminars. We're delighted to be hosting today's webinar. Our presenter today is Sylvain Caillou. Sylvain is technical director of Serena Software, who are one of the supporters of our events that are coming up in Amsterdam next month. We just to tell you very briefly, on the 15th of November, we're holding three events in Amsterdam addressing DevOps, application lifecycle management, and trends in process improvement. Uh, Sylvain will be joining the panel if you'd like to meet him in person at the DevOps Summit, which is at uh, devopssummit.com. So without further ado, I'd like to now hand over to Sylvain, and thank you again for joining today. Thank you, Alec. So uh, what I want to, to talk with you about today is uh, what is the center of what DevOps is. So it's releasing applications that have been developed by devs and will be uh, handled by ops. So uh, it's all about uh, being ready to do that, uh, to release it properly, and to be able to repeat it as uh, often as needed. And uh, in nowadays world, it's more and more often. So. The agenda will uh, go through what I call the pendulum of improvement. Uh, you will see that uh, if in our industry, uh, what is the main driver for uh, improvement and progress is certainly uh, industrialization of what we do uh, in development. And there is a strange pendulum effect when uh, you try to, uh, to improve. You push things into one direction to, to get this uh, uh, industrial uh, factor, but suddenly something happen and you see that uh, trying to improve is just moving the pendulum in the other way. So I will, I will, uh, I will get a little bit around that because there is uh, some lessons to be, uh, to be learned from, from this movement. Then we will go into uh, good practices. As we are talking DevOps, you will see that a body of norms are already existing uh, and good practices uh, have been uh, uh, invented and developed and, uh, and refined both in Dev and Ops. So, uh, I want just to, to cover that and see what are the good practices uh, for uh, uh, DevOps itself. And finally, we will go into what it is needed to be able to be ready to release and to repeat release uh, as often as we need. So uh, if you want to, uh, to ask questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to uh, push that into, uh, into the question uh, uh, tab. And I will uh, certainly answer them, but probably at the end of, the, of this, I will have some time in the end for, for the question and, and to answer the question. So, the pendulum of improvement. Uh, what we are trying to aim uh, at that moment is more and more quality. When I was developing a banking application uh, 25 years ago, uh, the way we were working was uh, to, uh, to put in production every day as much as possible of uh, uh, change that uh, we have uh, finalized into development to just be uh, able to uh, service the business. We are calling that the daily flow of release. And uh, uh, it was what the business was expecting. They were expecting that their, uh, the change was taken, taken care of as, as quick as possible. But as the, the months and years were passing, the complexity of the application was making that a bad practice. A bad practice because uh, every day in the morning when the, we were starting the day, we were just having the bunch of bugs that we have introduced into the application to correct first thing. Uh, just not to compromise uh, the production. And uh, we were just wondering how to avoid that and get the quality. So being now working for a, a software editor, let me have a, a small joke. We were just uh, making the fantasy that we can have uh, applications that could be run uh, as bug-free as software editor's applications. And uh, uh, we were knowing that to do, achieve that, we have to move into a different uh, way of developing software and not delivering everything every day uh, on the flow, but that we have to build releases so that we can integrate that and that we can have all the testing uh, and the user acceptance testing and the pre-production testing, all those things to be done properly before releasing into production. So the good practice was pushing, pushing uh, the pendulum in this direction uh, up to having uh, on the extreme uh, three or four main releases a year for the whole system. And it was hard to make uh, our uh, user, our business user, to accept that. And we had to explain 
uh, all the benefits and all the good things that they will get from that. So we've done it. We've achieved that. And it was good because uh, it was also a day when the infrastructure was costly. And uh, you could not have uh, multiple mainframes or multiple servers on which you can run uh, basic software of different versions. You, would add, you had to uh, uh, standardize and mutualize uh, on this platform so that multiple applications can work on the same infrastructure. So that was another reason for having those uh, four free main release only per year so that we can uh, be sure that all the infrastructure and all the uh, communication between the application that have to run on this thing work properly. And uh, as the, the year was passing, uh, we discovered that uh, it could have been pushed a bit too far. And business uh, was asking for flexibility, and they wanted more and more releases. So suddenly, uh, improving was just to push the pendulum in the other direction. And what was a bad practice yesterday? the daily flow of release, seems now to be desirable and being a good practice. And we give a new name to that. We call it continuous delivery or continuous deployment. And we called it a bad practice to have only four main releases per year. Because what we were delivering to the business was something they were wanting uh, three months ago or six months ago that was not fitting uh, some of the business uh, of every day. So uh, we were pushed into uh, doing more. and. Uh, there was a driving change in the technology. Uh, what happened also during the years was that uh, some new uh, technology and methodology were appearing, especially in, uh, we get the virtualization. So suddenly, mutualizing onto a single server was no more uh, a reason for having only uh, four main reasons a year. Because the business was telling us, hey, guys, uh, don't tell me that you need to have my application running on the same database versions than the other ones. You just have to set up a new virtual server for my application, and we can have a version of, uh, of the database that we want. So the business knows that things have changed, and they are now uh, remembering people that uh, because of that, we have to change the way we are uh, putting the application into production, and that we have to have more and more release. And there is another thing that was happening in terms of development methodology, which is the agile methodology, which is wanting, pushing to have more and more releases so that the feedback coming from the users is as early as possible. So just to achieve the promises of uh, agility, uh, we have to involve users and we have to deliver as soon as possible uh, application to them. So it is going to be a good practice to do continuous deployment. And this pendulum movement that I'm talking about into this uh, risk management domain, you know him from other uh, domain into, uh, into uh, our technology. Remember uh, fat client and uh, thin client. Uh, the pendulum has moved from thin client to fat client, then it was becoming very complex to deliver properly application on the fat client, and there was a change in the padding technology, which is called uh, the, uh, the web browser, and the web browser application. So suddenly, uh, the pendulum was moving in the other way. We, want, uh, we wanted to have only a uh, thin client. And then a thin client was not really uh, enough for user in terms of experience. So we, we are changing again and pushing towards the thin client with uh, fat functionality. <laughs> so this is typically what's happening into our uh, industry. Things are moving into, uh, into a global wave which is, in this case, the industrialization of our business. And uh, it is, uh, uh, all over the time, uh, while moving this, uh, this global way, having this pendulum effect that we have to take care and, and for which we have to take lessons. So we should not stick onto what is a good practice too long when a uh, paradigm change in the technology has been done. We have to, to, to take advantage of what uh, the technology is providing and don't be uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, static guy that, that, was, uh, that is sure to have, uh, to have the truth and remains into, uh, into a previous movement of the pendulum. So uh, in the DevOps, uh, we can talk about the good practices. And good practices uh, uh, are just about that. It's just about uh, 
release management and develop, de delivering into releases and delivering into a, a continuous way. If you look at the reasons uh, that were behind that, the daily flow release of yesterday, just as the continuous deployment of today, share exactly the same objective. We were wanting to respond to the business as quick as they want so that um, companies can uh, develop their new marketing, their new offering, and, and can uh, build quicker their business with their own, new, with their own uh, uh, customers. Uh, on the other way, the structure and scheduled release that uh, have to happen uh, on the extreme only three or four times a year uh, have also uh, the same objective. The idea is that uh, a follow-up testing of the application is happening and that uh, we can test that into the context of an, the whole system so that the overall integrity of the systems is maintained so that we get the quality. But we can't avoid any of them. We need to have uh, quality and business reactivity. So uh, even if uh, things are moving in the pendulum effect, we should not forget the good thing learned when pushing the pendulum in one side and, uh, uh, and moving it in the other way. You could not have no memory and say, what, is, what was bad is bad forever and was bad forever. And we have people that tend to do that. They are kind of gurus of the new ways. They just don't want to hear about the old ways. No, we, we have to keep, uh, to keep uh, some, uh, some better way of ending that and having a look at what was dependent on the technology. What makes the problem uh, go into another way is always uh, a change in the technology paradigm or the methodology paradigm. And that doesn't mean that everything is affected by this, uh, this paradigm change. So we have to, uh, to be more intelligent and see what it is. If you look at good practices, we also have another trouble, especially in, uh, in DevOps uh, and in risk management. A lot of good practices have been accumulated in application development about the development process, about the maturity of the team, of the organization that were into, the, uh, into this process. And we can even measure now, like with the CMMI and the SCAMPI, uh, exactly where we are in terms of maturity and what kind of uh, improvement should be done to, to the development process. So this is a very uh, mature way in terms of good practice. And it talks, of course, of release management because uh, the aim of the development group of a development team is to deliver an application. So you have some uh, vocabulary, some, some part of this uh, CMMI stuff and other good practices in development that talks about release management. On the other hand, you also have services management that has produced a large body of norms, uh, most famous being the ITIL one. When we talk about services catalog, services level agreement and, and good practices, also about uh, change management and the way we are going to, uh, to, de to deal with the change on the application and, of course, the release management. Unfortunately, uh, those people are using the same word and the same kind of concepts in a quite different way. And, and that's typical of the, uh, of the nowadays world in big organization. Ops is holding the services level agreement with the user and other application that must work into production uh, 24 hours per day, seven days per week, and they, they are looking at the change in a very uh, awkward way. And development has to build new application, and they have to push this thing into production. And they are into two silos. And uh, when we talk about continuous delivery, continuous deployment, we have to break these silos. We have to have those people that speak about different things with the same words. Uh, that have not the same objectives, uh, finally, but that, that could not be paid on the same objectives, uh, all of them, to work together and to uh, achieve what uh, the market is now calling, and it is really a buzzword for, uh, for the past uh, 12 months, which we call DevOps. We have to make them collaborate so that we can accelerate this thing. And uh, what would be nice and those people that live in application development or that live in, uh, in DevOps would love to have uh, a body of norm ready for them. Unfortunately, uh, DevOps is at the moment a gray zone. While application development and service management are now improved and uh, in seasoned uh, body of norms, uh, the release management is still in the uh, heroic times. 
uh, if you're familiar with CMMI, you should remember what we call the Eureka time. It's when the people make it happen. And they make it happen because they want it to happen. And everything depends on the individuals, what is in the, uh, in the mind of the individuals. And uh, it happens. Usually, uh, in, in organization, you find real heroes that are ready to, uh, to do a lot of sacrifice, that are ready to do a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of uh, uh, non-interesting work sometimes. Uh, you, you have people with masters <laughs> or with uh, BAs or with uh, uh, MBAs that is just copying uh, the content of registry from one machine to another being sure that they don't make a mistake and that they do it on every single server. And they do that at strange times. They do that when the business doesn't need the application. So it could be on the weekend, it could be uh, late at night. And it's costly because those people have uh, a lot of degree and are used into uh, mechanical works at, uh, uh, at overtime and overpaid uh, time. So uh, even if it's a uh, very right time and uh, and there is management is in between two well uh, body of norm. Uh, we have to see what's happening. Uh, and there is management nowadays is uh, leaving especially uh, and moving especially in the context of the agile. Agile development as promoted continuous build as a new discipline. And uh, now uh, they are pushing into the continuous deployment because this is the normal way. You build quickly new features into an application. You quickly need to have feedback from, uh, from the user. So you need to build it and to make sure that what you build is 100% ready to be delivered to the user as quickly as possible. That's the reason for continuous build. But now what you want is also to move along the different stages of the life cycle out of development to user acceptance testing and to production as quick as possible to get the feedback. But you want that with applications that are working properly. Continuous build is going to, to uh, take care of that and to be delivered as quick as possible to uh, the different users in the life cycle, which is going to be the reason for continuous deployment. So some uh, practices, some principles are emerging. And uh, I, I've tried to summarize here uh, what I've seen to be uh, not the Agile Manifesto, but the Continuous Deployment Manifesto. Not 12, but 8 uh, topic into that. And the first one being uh, that the deployment must be repeatable. And repeatable is the key word. You should not think of continuous deployment if you don't have made the effort. And if you don't have all the guys along the chain make the effort of having these things made repeatable. If it's not repeatable, you can't automate it. If you can't automate it, you will not be able to have continuous deployment. Dot. So the deployment process must be repeatable. Uh, to be able to, do, to achieve that, everybody has to look at what they do. And uh, I've met a number of, uh, of groups of people that say, yeah, but uh, from one version to the other of my application, it's not the same. My application is composed of four blocks. One block is... Uh, uh, typically uh, uh, working with, in the background uh, with some batch uh, process. Uh, we have a database management. We have a front end in the internet. And uh, sometimes I'm delivering three blocks, sometimes I'm delivering one block, sometimes I'm, differing, uh, I'm delivering something different. And the infrastructure could change because of the sensibility of my application to change. For example, uh, I can have a cluster in this next version which I don't have in the previous. So yes, this is happening, but you have to, to be uh, working into the two directions. You have to be looking into the very detailed activity that you have to do, and you have to, uh, to go back and see from a higher perspective the way it's structured. If you go on a higher perspective enough, you will see that indeed there is three blocks, and uh, if you have organized the very fine detail into uh, some uh, robots, some automates, that will take care of uh, those three blocks. And you can organize at the last minute which of the three blocks you want to associate into a deployment process. One, two, three, one, two, one, three, two, three, or only one of them. Uh, you will be able to have uh, some generic method and you will have constructed a repeatable process. Uh, and to be repeatable, everything should be automated. And when I mean everything, I mean also what you think is not automatable. So uh, try to imagine that uh, a manual process has to be uh, 
has to be taken care of and you have to register that. You must be sure that you are uh, adding some mechanism, some means to register that uh, some manual things has to be done and have really uh, be done uh, at any time. So uh, think of that. Everything should be automated. If it's not possible to have everything automated, you should trace what is not automated so that it uh, looks like in a trace, in an audit trace, and being able to audit uh, the deployment process is very important, especially if you are uh, working into a uh, Sarbanox layer or BAL3, that kind of world in finance. Uh, and be sure that everything is traced and run automatically. Another thing is, uh, and this is the third, uh, the third point, if it's hard and painful, do it often. Because if it's hard and painful, you do it uh, very uh, as, as less as possible. And you have to go through the books and be sure that you check everything, which is very difficult. So if you, uh, if you do that, you will never know how to automate this thing. So you have to send up sandbox and, and be sure that uh, you look at uh, all the, the difficulty that you, are, um, uh, that you have lived in the past or that you can envisage in the future so that you already take care of that and have something structured enough to be taken care of those things. And, and frankly, it's much more in, of interest to the people that uh, uh, do the, the, uh, the deployment, the delivery in your organization by just copying a registry anyway. So you also must have everything version and control. One key word in automating things is that some things are invariants and some things are variables. The invariant typically uh, are uh, binary code like uh, an, uh, an EAR in Java. And what is typically a viable stuff is uh, an XML file with uh, properties. So you should be uh, very keen to discover what are the invariants and what are the variables into your process. And you must set up and put in place some way of managing the variable in the context of the different environments that, com that combined together are building up your different stages into your deployment. If you do that, you have made a great, great steps into uh, the uh, uh, automation and into the repeatability of the process. And a pro as proper and as easy management of, the, uh, of, the, of those uh, viable parts is key with the DevOps group. Uh, key because some of them are coming from dev and will never come uh, from any other place. Uh, devs know some of the variables uh, that have to be put in place in the application. And some are coming from the ops and dev could not even know uh, those variables. So that's a way to uh, start communicating, have a proper uh, environment management with the variables that comes from the ops and one set of variables that comes from, from the dev. Uh, which will be uh, uh, made available for each uh, version, for each delivery of a set of applications. So everything must be versioned and controlled uh, into these aims, and you have to set up something. Then nobody should consider his job finished until it is uh, de delivered to the users. So that sounds like a uh, uh, basic truth, and it is. Uh, because just like point six is saying, uh, the value of an application is zero until a user is using it anyway. So that's another motivator that you have to, uh, to carry on to the team so that uh, the development team and the ops team works together on that, uh, the, the group of people you have put in charge of DevOps, uh, uh, make them, those people in development and ops, work together or work to the same home. Finally, uh, the, the, the two last points are uh, typical of, uh, of processes. We find that in CMI, we find that in IT, we have to find that into, uh, into any body of uh, good practice that could develop into, into the DevOps. Quality must be built uh, from the beginning and people should think of quality all the time and everybody should think of how to improve the process. So that's really uh, something that you can, uh, browsing uh, the internet, going from uh, one uh, blog to, uh, to a site, uh, find uh, that's emerging. I just have since it I uh, make a, a kind of summary here of those principles that, that I've seen moving around. So uh, control and versioning is very simple. You need to have uh, a kind of vault. Uh, it's here to uh, improve decision making. Release component, 
should be viewed here at, at a detailed level with transparency around status, risk, issues, and dependencies. So you need to have a structure to do that. Uh, being from a, a software editor, we have a solution for that. Uh, let's say that I don't care about that uh, today. Uh, I just have to reinforce the idea that you need to have something that is uh, uh, a kind of repository for things that needs to be installed and that gives you the visibility. The visibility most of the time uh, is not the same when you think of an application from the development side and from an application from the uh, uh, operation side. From the development side, you are, you are really seeing application uh, as application. And when you are going to see it from uh, the ops side, you see it as packages to be installed on environments. So you need to have something flexible enough to uh, let you be able to model that. And of course, you need to have uh, the capability to, uh, to manage invariant and variables. So think about that. Uh, but remember, version and configuration management is mandatory to achieve proper uh, operations into, into DevOps. Second one is automating. So automating means repeatability. So you should always think that if you want to do it quick, uh, you have to just press a button and it should work. So you have to think of how to structure and standardize the way works are, uh, the way team are working, uh, and uh, automating what cannot be. So everything that uh, uh, is manual should be uh, finding a way to be uh, uh, traced so that you can uh, audit it after one. And uh, another thing is, if you want to have a real automation, you need a thinking of tooling it. So there is a, a lot of ways to, uh, to uh, tool the automation. The basic one is building some kind of uh, set of scripts that you are going to, uh, to update and maintain. Or you can look at uh, what is available on the market, uh, whether from software editors on, uh, on the open market, to help you automate the way you are uh, deploying things and installing things on the different uh, stages of the life cycle. But automating and tooling the automation is also a must. If you don't tool it, you will not be into an industrial uh, uh, standardization, and you will have difficulties to be quick enough to do uh, uh, the continuous deployment. Finally, you should also think about the control over the deployment process, because the things are a little bit different. Uh, we are going to talk about it in a little, uh, in just a few slides, but uh, you will still uh, get some release because things have to go uh, into production in a in a organized way, in, and uh, and there still be dependencies between applications. So yeah, you will still have to think about um, that kind of release that have to be tested as a system. So uh, this will not happen the same way. So sometimes you will be able to push. Uh, very quick in the in continuous delivery mode, some application up to somewhere in the life cycle, so that you get uh, the testing uh, enough to be uh, to be happy with what has been done. But you will have to wait until the other application is aggregating to this one for the following for the following steps. So uh, this release type definition definitely uh, you will need to think about, and you will have to define what is a major release, a minor release, an emergency release, or that kind of thing. And if you do that, you will also have to have some violation type of activities so that when you are waiting for something else, you know when you can move to the next step so that all the things that have to work together uh, are ready for that. And of course, a calendar and planning is very important. Uh, if you try to push into production a very big number of applications the same day, it could be a big risk. You have to see that. You have to understand that. You have to manage content impact. It's very important. So that's the free domain on which you have to think about when you are putting that, that in place. And uh, this is another uh, kind of a pendulum movement, which says, where would I should put uh, the limit between what is done as continuous development pushed quickly every day and what is going to be, uh, to be done as uh, uh, a release train, so that is waiting for other pieces to work together. Uh, it is not by uh, uh, by chance that I've put um, my uh, uh, my target just in between integration and staging for UAT, because usually the maturity in uh, most of the big companies is there. Pushing things in as continuous development 
to, towards integration is a great way and it's very easy to uh, connect that with uh, existing uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, continuous build uh, type of uh, uh, organization you have uh, but unfortunately uh, most of the time uh, to, to push that until production is uh, mainly uh, the, an aim for people that uh, are a kind of uh, extreme in their way of seeing uh, agile in a company and not realistic so uh, you will have to uh, to put it that of course the aim is really to push to push that spin uh, as further as possible to uh, to the right so that you get uh, the best in terms of uh, of uh, flexibility but you should not compromise on quality so that's uh, that's a way of balancing between dev driven and ops driven risk management so yes, it is uh, definitely uh, something that is uh, that is new. You uh, you will have a lot of benefits, but to have uh, uh, to get these benefits, you have to uh, to get end-to-end -end control on what you are doing, and uh, you you have to to plan what you are going to do, and you should be able to audit things. Uh, you also have to have a lot of control and user authentication, which is. Uh, I'm not a believer of uh, the single guy uh, pushing all his doing from uh, the beginning of development down to uh, down to uh, to production. And I don't think that any big organization is going to uh, to be happy with that. You also have to uh, still give to uh, development and operations people a comprehensive view of what they are doing. So uh, development means application, and they should still understand what are their application and how their application are going down the gully. And you have uh, ops. That things environment and what have to be installed on each environment for having uh, all these RFCs that have been identified into the IT process to be solved and uh, have the business user happy and being able to uh, to provide all these uh, uh, level of uh, of services that they have contracted. Uh, you should full think of full automation of deploying install activities. So really tooling to do that and being able to. Uh, to, uh, to have uh, this, uh, uh, this thing with uh, tools that are as easy as possible to, to, uh, to be used is something that should be done. The idea is to have uh, the number of releases, the complexity of release under control, and being able to uh, have very big release to be, uh, to be uh, done uh, as, in, as often enough to be uh, under control. You have to remember also uh, that automation will be uh, the only way to uh, uh, manage a large number of target servers that could be managed, and especially in the world of virtualization, when you can have a very, very big number of servers, or even you can add servers on the fly, uh, this automation way is going uh, uh, to, pr to provide a real way of handling that. And of course, uh, uh, the environment dependent parameters have to be managed as well as the application one. So you see, it's it's a new it's a new uh, uh, discipline. And uh, as any of the discipline that uh, are uh, pushed by the uh, agility, uh, it needs to be uh, really under control. I don't think that uh, agility uh, could be uh, no methodology. It is uh, on the reverse, something that needs to be very, very uh, uh, attentive to what you do and following up the rules to, to achieve the thing. So. Uh, if you achieve all those things, you are probably in the good way to be able to uh, to, uh, to to put in place the continuous develop deployment. Um, it doesn't mean that you need to be agile in development, uh, but uh, if you are agile in development, you will need to be able to do continuous delivery anyway. So uh, think about the way you want to to be there, and and be sure that you are following up uh, all the uh, the eight principles that are that are uh, uh, at the core of the emergent uh, practices, good practices on this market. So this is uh, what I was wanting to, uh, to, uh, to share with you uh, today. And uh, I I'm going to look at the questions and read the questions and answer them. So uh, one of the questions uh, says, how do you convince the business and uh, that they need to spend loads of money at the beginning of a project in order to have continuous deployment. 
you, you will not convince any business that they have to uh, spend money into infrastructure, unfortunately. So uh, it should be a part of uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, shared benefits and understood benefits. If you don't have uh, a strategic sponsor in your company to put that in place, uh, no chance that it happens. But uh, you can also share with them some statistics and don't be shy about that. Uh, I have customers uh, that uh, report 97% of faulty uh, deployment in production. Doesn't mean that there was a 97 application that doesn't work in production the following day, but some things had to be done. Some of the uh, computer testing, testing that has been done in the last minutes shows that something had be, has been forgotten or something is happening in, during the, the process. If you can imagine how many times uh, when trying to install an application, you have to copy file on the server and there is no disk space of the server just to, uh, to have those files copied, you would be surprised. It's happening quite often. So if you uh, share the difficulties, if you share and explain what uh, the DevOps are leaving and uh, how risky uh, the business is, uh, is at stake, uh, that's probably a way of convincing the business that some money should be put into this. Uh, on another way, you say loads of money. That's not really true. Uh, there is different ways, and you can have a progressive approach to uh, to put uh, DevOps in place. Uh, I can't believe that uh, in a normal company, some automation automatization effort have not been already engaged. So you will find some uh, some of those things already in place, but not structured. Uh, different from one team to another, different from one application to another. So it's also a question of, rationaliz of rationalization and, and teamwork on this. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I have no magic. And uh, <laughs> there is no way, especially nowadays in uh, the economical condition we have, to convince a business to, uh, to, uh, to, to build a big project uh, into infrastructure and, and not onto, uh, onto the day-to-day -day, uh, business applications. But uh, there is a way of communicating and, and improving, certainly. OK. So there is another question. Are there any change management system which can be used to help an organization uh, become more uh, DevOps? Uh, there is a lot of, uh, of uh, configuration management systems and uh, and tools on the market at the moment. I probably am uh, not going to name all of them, but uh, my company, Serena being one of them, uh, you can find probably uh, 40 to, to 50 uh, open source uh, initiative into, uh, into the DevOps. Uh, if you look at uh, what Ovem has done, Ovem has produced a report about DevOps, and uh, you will see all the big names like BMC, IBM, HP, uh, Serena, <laughs> and, and others into that. So this is really uh, uh, a very busy uh, market at the moment and a lot of initiatives is happening. So uh, you, you can certainly uh, you can certainly find something uh, which which is going to solve your pain and which is going to uh, to help you in, in, in this direction. Uh, it's really depending on what what uh, you are living at the moment. Uh, is it a, a control problem? Is it an automation problem? Is it uh, uh, an environment management problem? So, so you can you can find a solution to that, and you can uh, have a progressive approach to that. You don't have to uh, to put all the free bricks, control vault and uh, uh, and uh, automation in place at the same time. Uh, you can certainly uh, have some uh, some activities that uh, would progress onto the most painful domain for your organization. And I encourage you to uh, to have this approach uh, if you, uh, especially if you are a big company. Uh, if you uh, if you don't have at least one of those problems uh, uh, already uh, looked in detail by your team before you try to to put in place a big solution, uh, it's possible that you don't understand what's going to happen, and and that's not a good thing. So uh, try to be uh, to be seeing those of those problem uh, probably also uh, in different ways. A lot of companies have established uh, configuration management for the development, and it's a good uh, a good uh, starting point to look at that. How is my configuration management system could be seen as a vault? Uh, because it's not exactly the same thing than having a configuration management system for development and for DevOps. So how is it flexible? How can I change that? How can I put that in place? What are the solutions to have uh, a vault 
of the uh, uh, all the component that could be uh, put in production into my company, uh, which is uh, not only the one that I develop, but also the one that I buy from uh, from the market, some that I made, some uh, third party to develop for me. Uh, how can I uh, be able to manage all those things in a consistent way? So yes, there is uh, various possibilities for that, and uh, and, I, and if you want. Uh, I encourage you to uh, to speak with me when when we can matter. We will we'll tell you about the different solutions that my customers have put in place. Okay, there's another question. DevOps seems not to be very inclusive of QA or testing teams. Is this true? Uh, yes, it is true. Uh, if you think of uh, of testing as functional testing, in DevOps, functional testing is the, the most complex things to put in place. Uh, functional testing, uh, when you are uh, talking about an integrated environment, is extremely more complex to build as a repeatable uh, process than anything else. But that doesn't mean that testing is not part of the DevOps uh, activities. You have to go back to uh, to, uh, to development. What's happening in development uh, with agility is that uh, on one uh, of the extremity, you build first the testing code before test before building the code itself. So there is a lot of testing in agility, uh, a lot of a lot of unit of unit testing, and then you move to uh, to uh, user acceptance testing, uh, which is out of the scope of DevOps. Uh, but what DevOps should build into uh, the process is what I call confidence testing. So everything that is, uh, I would say, post-installation testing to see that things are properly done have to be a uh, think of part of the, uh, of the deployment of the delivery process. You should test if uh, a server application is starting properly. You should uh, verify that the application that is talking on a specific uh, port is really uh, being talking on this port, a lot of those things. But uh, being into uh, into a detailed uh, functional uh, uh, testing is uh, something that is, uh, from my point of view, and that's probably why you say that because it is a, a general uh, uh, a general uh, agreement is too complex to be made absolutely repeatable uh, from one application version to another, uh, especially. Uh, uh, if you imagine that uh, the DevOps team is not going to know the content, the functional content of the application when it's going to do to do the, the delivery. So yes, uh, it's not exactly the same uh, the same level of uh, automation and detail that you can have in terms of testing. And yes, probably uh, the QA team is a little bit uh, out of the, of the movement, out of the group that is talking about DevOps. Alec, uh, there is no more question, uh, and and I guess we are reaching. Uh, yeah, we are three minutes before the end, so I don't know uh, if you want to have a conclusion uh, word. Thank you, Sylvain. Thank you. That was an excellent webinar. And if anybody would like the recording, we we, we plan to make this available afterwards. And also just to remind you about the, the DevOps Summit on the fifteenth of November, where where you can actually meet Sylvain in person. Uh, just to repeat, the website address for that is devopssummit.com. So, Sylvain and everybody who attended, thank you very much indeed.